Let's start with Book 1, The Early Years. And I'm going to read certain sections here, partly because this is a book that is a book of confessions, confession of sin, confession of faith, confession of praise for God, but it's also meant to be read by other people. He is confessing before God, and this book is in the second person directed to God, but it's also something that he intends other Christians to read. So it is a confession that is meant to be a public confession heard by other Christians. You are great, Lord, and highly to be praised. Great is your power, and your wisdom is immeasurable. Here he's quoting the Psalms. Man, a little piece of your creation, desires to praise you, a human being bearing his mortality with him, carrying with him the witness of his sin and the witness that you resist the proud. Nevertheless, to praise you is the desire of man, a little piece of your creation. You stir man to take pleasure in praising you, because you've made us for yourself, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. There are several things that I think are important in that very first paragraph. Notice it starts out with praise. You are great, Lord, and greatly to be praised. That is in the second person, directly addressing God, quoting from the Psalms. And we get man, a little piece of your creation. Humanity is itself only a small part of creation. He is not putting himself or mankind in general at the center of the universe here. He's saying, look, we're just a small part. <laughs> we are just a tiny part. In Aristotle, the whole idea is that the earth is the center of everything. Everything revolves around the earth and everything revolves around us. Indeed, a model of what it is to be a human being for Aristotle is something like a sphere rotating on its axis, something that is both fully actual and fully potential at the same time. That would be an ideal of substance. God is the highest one of those, but what's at the very center of the entire universe God creates? Us and the earth we live on. That is not Augustine's conception. Instead, we're a little chunk of creation. God is immeasurably greater than we are. Now, we carry with us the witness of sin. And so our sinful character is also front and center here. Augustine is someone who thinks that we are inherently sinful creatures. We are not creatures who can be perfected. That sin is not something that can be removed. He does not think, with Socrates, for example, that education, that knowledge, are the solution to our problems of sin, of weakness of will, of giving in to temptation. Nor does he think that the solution is to somehow empower reason. Indeed, he thinks that he has done that, he has devoted himself to study, but on the other hand, that there are plenty of people, plenty of Christians who he recognizes as more devout, more dedicated, a better Christian than he is. And so Plato's solution won't do either. Aristotle putting human happiness at the center of things, saying our final end is happening. Happiness? Nonsense. In fact, he deals with that in the very next section here. To praise you is the desire of man. What is our highest good? What is that ultimate final aim? That which is always to be sought for its own sake and never for the sake of something else. It's not human happiness. It's not the good for man. No, it is the desire of us to praise God, to praise you, he's saying. You stir man to take pleasure in praising you. Worshiping God is something that is to be desired for its own sake and not merely for the sake of something else, not as a way of earning your way into heaven, not because it's good for something, because it is something valuable in itself. You have made us for yourself. Insofar as we are creatures of God, our ultimate aim is dependent on God. We can't think of ourselves as apart from the purposes of God. Think about something simple that's a human artifact, like a pencil. You can't think about what a pencil is for without reference to its maker. People make pencils because they're instruments that we can use for writing. And similarly, God has created us. You can't understand our purpose apart from God. And so even if you start from Aristotle's starting point and say, well, some things are desired for the sake of something else, and we are to be judged good according to our ability to fulfill our function. What is our function? Well, it's rational activity that makes us different. Augustine would say that's absurd. That's not what's crucial to us. What is crucial, think about any other instrument. To understand what it's for, what its function is, you have to think about who made it and why. And so similarly here, you have to think who made us and why. 
so the answer to the human function, and therefore the ultimate answer to the nature of virtue, if we adopt that Aristotelian starting point, is that we were crafted by God. We were crafted by God for a purpose, and that purpose includes praising God, worshiping God. Indeed, our heart is restless until it rests in you. We cannot be fulfilled. We cannot fulfill our function except insofar as we seek God. We've got to seek God. We've got to praise God. We've got to worship God. God is at the very center of our, of our being. There is, as a Christian song puts it, a God-shaped hole in all of us. But that leaves out, in a sense, the dynamic aspect. We fulfill our function by seeking God. God is the being that made us. Our function depends on God. We are for praising God, glorifying God, worshiping God. And we are restless. We will not be fulfilled. We cannot attain even what Aristotle considers happiness apart from God. Our hearts are restless until they rest in God. Let's go on to the second paragraph. Grant me, Lord, to know and understand which comes first, to call upon you or to praise you, and whether knowing you precedes calling upon you. But who calls upon you when he doesn't know you? Augustine has in mind here something like the paradox of inquiry or the paradox of analysis. We talked about that a little bit in connection with the last section of Plato's Carmides. And here it pops up again. And for Augustine here, it's not merely an intellectual question. To what extent do I have to understand God and seek God in order to praise God? How do I know what I'm praising? Basically, his thought is, if I haven't sought God, if I don't understand God, then what is this being that I'm praising? Who am, who am I worshiping if I don't really understand what God is? On the other hand, how can I begin to understand or seek God if I don't praise God, if I don't understand God, if I don't recognize that God, my creator, is far greater than myself or even this entire universe? And so he feels trapped here, but it's not merely, as I said, an intellectual problem. It's partly a question of how we seek God. Do we do it? in primarily and first an intellectual fact, fashion, trying to understand God? Or do we do it instead by devoting ourselves to God, to praising God, to worshiping God, to fulfilling our function as God might see it, and then trying through that process of praise, through the process of worship, to understand God and come to some knowledge of Him? It is an ultimately practical question for any Christian. It isn't just a theoretical question of interest to a philosopher. It's of immediate interest to anybody who wants to understand, well, and not only wants to understand, but wants to worship God, wants to fulfill their very function. He says, an ignorant person might call upon someone else instead of the right one. And so there is a real danger here to praise God, to worship God, can be a dangerous thing if we have no idea what that being is that we're praising. We may be led off into completely the wrong direction, into a kind of religion that is a false religion with a false god. And so there's a real practical danger here, as well as a theoretical danger. But surely you may be called upon in prayer that you may be known. How do we go about knowing God unless we seek God in the form, in part, of praise, of prayer, of searching to have a relationship with God? So it looks like we can't understand God apart from our relationship with God, and that relationship inevitably involves an awareness of God's greatness, and so it inevitably involves praise and worship. But on the other hand, well, how do we do it if we don't have some understanding of what it is we're seeking and what being we're praying to and worshiping and praising? So it is a difficult problem. They will praise the Lord who seek for him. Quoting again the Psalms. In seeking him, they find him, and in finding, they will praise him. Lord, I would seek you calling upon you, and calling upon you is an act of believing in you. You have been preached to us. My faith, Lord, calls upon you. It is your gift to me. You breathed it into me by the humanity of your son, by the ministry of your preacher. So here is how he seeks to resolve that. And I see at least two things going on in this paragraph. First of all, in seeking him, they find him. They find him, and in finding him, they will praise him. So there is a connection between seeking and finding here, a connection between understanding and the search, a search that does involve prayer, does involve praise, does involve worship. And so 
in a certain sense, he's saying, look, these things go together. It's not as if first one has to happen and then the other has to happen. They have to happen as part of the same process. Insofar as you seek, you will find, if you indeed engage in this process of prayer and reflection and praise and worship. So one of the th things that is a consideration here is that there's a sort of back and forth. There are all sorts of things we don't accomplish all at once. You can learn several things together. You can learn a set of concepts together. It's not as if you have to go through first this concept, then that concept, and so on. Often we do it by learning a bunch of things all at once, one reinforcing the other. So, as I read him, Augustine is saying, it's like that. It's like learning a set of color concepts. It's not as if you have to, for example, understand what red is before you can understand what green is or blue is. Instead, you learn the colors together, and then you can refine it and learn not just about red, but about crimson and scarlet and so forth. So, this is something that is a process. It's a process that admits of further refinement, but we have to do these things together. We don't first seek and then worship. We don't first worship and then seek. They're all part of the same process. They are part of a package, and gradually we get to learn and understand God's nature better. We get to praise more meaningfully. We get to worship more meaningfully. We get to pray with a clearer understanding of that being that we're praying to. All of those things are a unit. But there's something else being said here. You have been preached to us. So we're not having to do this on our own. There is in part a historical factor here. Other people have done this. They've gone through that process before us. And so just as someone else can teach us the color concepts, we don't have to figure them out on our own. So we have prior guides. And in fact, the ultimate guide of God's Son sent in the, into the world to save us. We have a tradition stemming from that revelation of preachers who have been preaching this word. And so we don't have to start on our own. We do have places to look. We have the scriptures. We have the life of Jesus. We have the tradition of the church and the preaching that's gone on in the church to help be a guide. Other people have gone through this path before us, and we can use them to help us both in understanding and in forming that relationship with God of which prayer, praise, worship are all parts.